When I um, got together with Susie, I found that her family uh, were not Christians, and her dad uh, was a cattle rancher. Um, he was kind of a redneck, and um, he was this, uh, you know, kind of raspy voice, and God damn, yeah, you know, he would, you know, curse prolifically here and there, and um, it was an adjustment for me, uh, just getting used to him, but uh, I had, my dad had died uh, when I was 17, when I got married, I was 27, and the Lord put it on my heart, um, really to build a bond with him. He was an atheist at that time, but to build a bond. And so I asked his permission if I could call him dad. Uh, and that was a big step for me. Uh, I wrote a book on father wounds, so those weren't words that would come easily out of my mouth. And candidly, he wasn't the personification of a father figure that I imagined. But Susie uh, always loved her dad, respected him. And the story she told about his relationship with her and things he had done just made my estimation of him always be very, very high. But it was an awkward moment asking if I could call him dad, which I then did, and always did for many, many years, called him dad. Um, and so when, uh, as time went on, the family received the Lord, uh, his son, and then another son, and then a daughter-in-law, another daughter-in-law, and then his wife, and then finally he gave his heart to the Lord. Um, it was a gradual uh, opportunity to see the Lord move in our family. But <clears throat> ironically, uh, his uh, dear wife passed away, uh, my mother-in-law, a great lady, and then he had cancer and was failing. And the last time he came to our house, uh, a week or two before he passed away, we drove him down, down here to Roseville, and uh, getting out of the car, coming to our house, was, was a lot of effort. And uh, the driveway th that we had at that time was a minor slope. I don't know what the degrees were, but it was a minimal slope, just enough to keep the water from standing. But as he got out of the car and began to try and go up that slight grade, he couldn't do it. And there was this halting moment. There was this moment where, you know, dad, this cattle ranching guy, you know, barbed wire ripped his arm open. What's that? That's ah, nothing. You know, I mean, just this guy who was now a frail, humbled man who had become much more tender over the years. But we have this moment now where <laughs> I realize he's not going to make it. And I've got to make a decision. So I've got to say, I said, Dad, it's okay. Let me, let me lift you up. And so I reached down, and he, of course, had lost a lot of weight and just picked him up in my arms. It was one of those off-the-chart moments where, you know, it doesn't take much for me to cry, but I had never seen him cry. And all of a sudden, he begins to sob. And I begin to carry him into the house, and I said, it's okay, Dad, it's okay. I think about emotion. You know, I think about, in life, emotion. It was one of the most emotionally awkward moments, initially, but it was one of the most emotionally powerful moments as well. Is God an emotional being? Yeah, we are emotional because God's emotional. Does he function based on emotion? No. He functions based on wisdom. And sometimes, wisdom dictates emotion. We're not emotional at times outside of his creative plan for us. He's written in the script. He wrote in the script that moment with my father-in-law. Uh, at times, appropriate emotion and appropriate wisdom join together. And, and I look at this age that we're in and I see at times a disconnect. And I'll talk about that. But in the Bible, some of the men and women God used had emotion. Jeremiah, for example, Jeremiah 9.1, it says this in the message, I wish my head were a well of water and my eyes fountain, fountains of tears so I could weep day and night for casualties among my dear, dear people. How many of you are glad you're not Jeremiah? Okay, you know, you read about his life and go, wow, I don't be Jeremiah. But Jeremiah was a prophet of God who wept. He's called the weeping prophet. 
I think of George Whitfield, the great preacher, uh, the thunderous preacher who as a teenager would mock Christians and uh, stand up in bars and pretend to preach. And then he and his friends would get drunk and go and run up and down inside church meetings to try and break up church meetings. Perfect candidate to be a preacher. He became a preacher, got converted, and, and be, became one of the key figures in the first great awakening in America. Benjamin Franklin said uh, that he could be heard clearly a mile away, a booming voice, a thundering man. And yet he himself it was said of him that they never saw him preach except without weeping, without crying. George Whitfield commonly finished up his message crying, come to Jesus with his hands uplifted and his eyes streaming with tears. One man who came to do him harm, came to beat him up, said, how could I be angry at a man who wept so much for my soul? Emotion. You know, he wasn't a crybaby, but he was a guy who had a heart after God. And uh, I believe true love requires emotion. You know, we live in a culture, though, where we are so overstimulated and, and we're so underapplicated. We, we, we have emotional opportunities in commercials. Now, again, in my family, I have a wife and two beautiful daughters, and I am the most emotional of them all. And I may mock, I am a caricature in our family. Because they would say at different moments, they'd say, Dad, you're not crying right now. Are you crying? It's a commercial, Dad. It's a commercial. It's, it's, they're acting. And, and so I would deflect at different moments their comments. But yeah, I was being moved. It's an, a, it's an a T and t commercial. <laughs> this is serious here. And it is awkward. I mean, I, I, there are times, candidly, when I would like to cry less. This is not like, I don't think I love... No, there are times, Francis, suck it up. Stop. <laughs> because it's just not going to help that moment. It's either choking with words or, you know, I'm in, a, in an opportunity that's serious. Like, like this week, we are getting ready for the MLK celebration at Capital Christian, except, uh, January the uh, 18th. Big deal every year. And I'm part of the MLK committee the last number of years. And then an MLK march on the 19th. And, and uh, so I was going to our monthly meeting last Thursday, which was this stormy day. And it was pretty stormy. And so a number of folks did not make it to that meeting. And so it meets early, 7.30, at Capital Christian. And um, I come in, and I'm the only non-African American in the room. And um, the discussion turns toward the events that are taking place. And we've been processing that together. But you have to understand, if you can imagine a white guy in a room with African Americans who are emotionally convulsing with what's going on. All kinds of stuff going on inside of them. And, and these are people I love, I respect. Uh, generally speaking, they're a bit older. They're in their 50s. Um, they're, they're mature. <laughs> I miss that. What is that? Does that mean it's, it's really older? Well, yeah, I'm... I, I have the gift of immaturity. That's, that's different. If you're immature, you can, no. But yeah, they're, they're younger than I am. That's true. But they're, <laughs> I'll have to find out later on what I had said, but they're a bit older. They're in their 50s. Is that not true? Okay. I found that 66 is the new 30. Is that true? That could be true. Anyway, so as the conversation goes on, it, it's, it's very moving. And they're saying, you know, with all that's going on, we have to expect at the celebration uh, that we need to share in some way, in a, in a relevant way, a pertinent way to what's going on. The same thing with the march. And so anyway, the, the basic theme, and we're working on talking points, and I'm going to be doing a video with leaders around the region, but um, Micah 6 eight, he has showed you, a man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And even though each of us may have our own paradigm of exactly what justice looks like in any given situation, we'd all recognize that justice is very important, and we want that. And so the point I'm making is it was very emotional for me 
to be there with these dear men and women who I love and respect and watching the pains as they are fathers and mothers in this region uh, and watching a younger generation struggling. And, and again, Dr. King was the most significant man in my youth. And I said to them, you know, I like you, have, uh, I feel sad that uh, 50 years after kind of the lights went on in my heart and I stepped up to do something uh, to connect in some way with the African-American community, uh, at, at times I don't know how much progress has been fully made. Other times I get a good glimpse and I think a lot of progress has been made. But the point is, it's still a very, very moving and emotional experience. And, and if we are really called to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, then emotion has to be a part of each of our lives in some way. So our, our tendency though, because of all that's going on uh, in, in the planet in terms of the, the mediums that are assaulting us in our minds and hearts, we can get lost uh, in, in being overstimulated and under responsive to that stimulation. And so um, my I, I went way into this message here. This is crazy here. I'm done. That's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Uh, does God really care? Does God really fear, feel? Uh, here's a song, uh, a hymn years ago. Does, do, does Jesus care when my heart is pained? Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. He cares. I don't know if we write songs exactly like that today, but, but uh, it's another funny thing. I'm not sure what's funny about that. I don't know. But there's a caring emotional dimension to that. There's someone obviously writing the song going, I have to believe that God cares about what I'm going through at this moment. And I believe that for all of us. Jesus does care. Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. Johnny Erickson was a 17-year-old girl who one day uh, in a lake dove in, broke her neck, was paralyzed from the neck down, became a paraplegic, uh, began to learn how to paint with her mouth, uh, painted beautiful paintings, and then, as God would have it, developed a ministry uh, to people who had special needs, and now ministers to millions of people around the world. You think her life's over, it's done, finito. No, she's just getting going. Teenage girl. Sucks it up. I, they made a movie about her some 35 years ago that uh, showed even in it uh, what she had gone through. But she said this in a book called When God Weeps, Why Our Sufferings Matter to the Almighty. By itself, suffering does no good. But when we see it as the thing between God and us, it has meaning. Wedged in the crux, the cross, suffering becomes a transaction. The cross is a place of transaction. It is the place where power happens between us and God. I know that. I know there are moments when I cry often alone, uh, maybe driving down a road or up early in the morning or just uh, at a tender moment and I'm crying out to God for help. I know a transaction has taken place. I know he hears the cry of my heart. Not always, but I know in certain moments that that is, is happening. Uh, are we appropriately emotionally connected or disconnected? I wrote a book in 2011 as the recession happened in uh, 2007 and 8 and began to kind of settle in, people losing homes and uh, jobs and just their lives being turned upside down. Uh, I saw a numbness take place within the church, this church, within the culture. I wrote a book called Numb. Here's an excerpt. We are, are, why are so many people numb today? Numb to life, numb to God, numb to one another. The word numb literally means taken or seized as by cold or grief. Candy talked about her grief. You know, and a lot of people, they just, they're done. They're, they're done. They go into a fetal position. I've lost my husband. I'm an older woman. I'm retired from pastoring. I'm done. Uh, she just waxed her surfboard and said, hey, uh, let's go hang 10 for Jesus at Folsom Prison, which makes complete sense, only in heaven. On earth, it's like, seriously, taken by or seized by cold or grief. It's been defined as deprived of the power to feel or move normally through cold or shock 
Again, frozen fingers are numb. Frozen hearts are numb. The greatest, uh, emotionally unresponsive, indifferent, paralyzed, living a numb existence leaves us desensitized, powerless, unresponsive, and unable to feel fully alive. Sadly, numb defines many in our generation. So I find the concern in my heart is, God, do I feel like you feel? You know, yes, there are times when I, I think my emotion is not helpful. But there are times when I wonder, where is my mo- Why don't I feel? Why don't I care at this given moment in an appropriate way about the need that is before me? So the greatest challenges in this age are overstimulation and undersensitivity. We have too many options, too easily accessible, packed with so much intensity. Our circuit breakers are being programmed to be less and less sensitive. And you think about that, you know. Uh, we are overhyped and underhelped. Now, there was a time in my life I don't talk a lot about, about it, but it was a difficult season for um, many years ago where I was hardly able uh, to take care of myself. And actually, people had to take care of me. Uh, I couldn't feed myself. They carried me around. I was crying a lot during that season. It went on for over a year. I was a baby. I was a baby. Let's try it again. Okay, anyway. <sighs> I was a baby. Did I mention that to you? So it, you could listen to that and go, wow, how many, you, that happened to you too. You remember that? It's kind of hard to talk about an emotional time. Babies cry a lot. Do you notice that? But as they get older, they, they should cry less. Not all of us, but many times that's true. But I, when Jesus said this in Luke 18, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Now, we can see the innocence of children, the trust of children. I remember our girls and uh, Ben and Hav are now doing it with their kids as they travel, but we would load our girls into vehicles in the middle of the night to drive across the country. And they would just get out of bed, you know, like little penguins, and just walk over to the car, and then they're going across the country. They would never say, no, Dad, what exactly is about to happen right now? (laughs) They they were trusting, compliant, and there's obviously a stewardship with that, uh, but there's something about a little child. Now, I can, we can see that sensitivity and trust, but is emotion a part of it? I, I think maybe part of that childlikeness is such a sensitivity that they would, and of course, it's too much in, um, in the baby stage, but as we get older, do we just become hardened and crusty and you know, we don't want to have a childlike heart? We don't feel like a child feels. Emotional overreaction or underreaction, you can tear up. This is our challenge in our culture. You can tear up during an ASPCA battered dog commercial or be so emotionally wrung out you're listless during a wounded warrior commercial where heroes have lost limbs in order for us to raise our children in safety and ensure our freedom to worship God even today. So, okay, you can, you can be literally laughing at a comedy and then watch a tear-jerking movie, and all of a sudden, in, in one night, you're experiencing the spectrum. Uh, it's been said that comedy and tragedy meet at a point of infinity where they're suddenly combined, and uh, you can go one degree in either direction, and you'll find the limits of comedy and tragedy. And I found that's true. There's a, there's, a, there's a time, you know, when Paul the Apostle was stoned and left for dead outside the city of Lystra or Iconium, um, I think he just said, I- I'm positive he began to crack jokes. You know, lying under a pile of rocks, said, this, is, this is crazy. God, what's your plan with me here? I, I-, I think humor, ha- you have to, when-, when Mountain Mike's son Ryan died, after 27 days in the hospital, we went to our house and, and we laughed. It was a crazy night. We made a video of it. I, I, Mike put on women's clothes. 
It was a funny, it was just a funny night. We had cried so much, and then we just laughed and cried and laughed and cried and laughed and cried because we didn't know what to do. I have no idea where he put Mountain Mike. It's sad. But anyway, just pray for Mike. But uh, it was a moment. He doesn't do that a lot now. But Now, my goal is not to critique us or be emotional during this message. This is really a cerebral assessment of emotion in our lives. Is there room for us to feel like God feels? That's the name of the message, by the way. We may have passed that slide. Uh, Feeling what God feels. Does God want us to feel what he feels? Um, Interactive question. Take out, we have two tonight. Uh, Take out your, again, the app, people who are getting the app are living longer, making more money. We don't know why this is, but it's an extraordinary thing. Over 1,600 people have gotten the app. Get the app, please. Uh, The Rock of Roseville app, get that. Go into live, go into interactive. And here is the first question. Do you tend to overreact or underreact emotionally? Um, And so you're just going to vote in the app. I tend to overreact emotionally. I tend to underreact emotionally. I usually have an appropriate emotional reaction. And then lastly, I don't know. My emotions are suppressed. And I'm going to press one. What else would you expect? So... But it looks like I'm not alone. We have a lot of crybabies. Only kidding, in the room there. We have a lot of us who tend to overreact, some underreacting. Uh, not that many appropriate. I had no idea what we we're going to expect there. Well, that's interesting. Overreact. Hmm. Maybe that's why you go to this church. I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe all the emotionally balanced people go elsewhere. But anyway, no, kidding, a little joke. Well, I didn't know what to expect. I really did not. Because I feel oftentimes I am too emotional. And some of you do. My wife feels I'm too emotional. So my kids feel I'm too emotional. My dog thinks it's just the perfect amount. <laughs> okay, so that's, a, that's a, whatever that means. It's the, the majority, a slight majority there. Now, some numbness that happens to us comes from us resisting God. Back in the book, numb. Much of the numbness that people experience today comes from a conscience that has ceased to feel. In the New Testament, Paul warned against this type of dead, hardened conscience, which has been seared and become callous. You know, the icy, frozen hearts of ISIS. Think about people who could just cold-bloodedly kill people. You know, consciences that are hardened and seared and callous. They hate and kill without emotion. Uh, It's even more frightening when the the deadness is not caused by delusion, but by a deliberate commitment to resist the will of God. In life, if we wait to get caught instead of turning ourselves in, our conscience will become corrupted and polluted. Scripture confirms this. Every age has hearts that are dead and deluded. Titus said this, everything pure Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and their conscience is corrupted. You know, if I'm going to stand before God in 45 minutes, I want to experience life as God intended. I have no excuse that God has not done much for me. (laughs) Are you serious? I am the most spoiled person in this room, and so are you. If you're seeing your life from, from God's perspective, none of you have been shortchanged. You've all been lavishly overpaid, given just the right temperament, personality, history, everything. I can't go back in my life, even though I don't like to think about my childhood. It made me the person I am today. Tonight, tonight I'll go after this to a party with Terry Little for the Koinonia girls every year. We have a Christmas party. Can't wait to see the girls, bring candy for them, love on them. But I wouldn't be doing that. We, Terry and I have been doing that now for 11 years. Wouldn't be doing it if I had a a father who was everything. I had a father who was not a player in my life. Makes me want to be a good dad, naturally, spiritually. So our pain makes us the people God wants us to be if we'll respond well. Now, we can, though, give away our emotion on TV, internet stories. We can give away our tears on imaginary... I remember a woman came to a pastor and said, Pastor, 
we need to pray. And she mentioned the name of the person. The pastor said, that, that's a soap opera. That's not a real person. I know, I know, but she really needs our prayer. Could you... We can go give away our emotion. You say, well, I, I would never do that. Do you give away emotion in songs and movies and you know, videos on the internet? Do you give away emotion for things that maybe aren't fully real? Or, or do you and I have the emotion... You know, I, right now on Facebook, because I travel for 18 years, uh, I have, I'm full up on Facebook. I'm going to go public in January because I've over, I have 5,000 friends for a while now. And so I have people who have contacted me over the years. Uh, you gave me a prophetic word. You spoke. You've been like a father to me. And now some of them come and they say, my wife of 30 years passed away. I, I don't remember them. I may have stayed in their home. I can't remember all the people that I have met over the years. But do I have, what do I have for that person? And I find myself often feeling I don't have the emotion I need for this moment. Be it people online, uh, talking to someone yesterday on the phone in our city, sick, sick very, very much in need. Um, and they could die. Um, and, and then talk to their wife later on. And it's just, you know, do I have what it takes? Do you have what it takes? Um, to, to emotionally respond well. Here's a picture. I just show it to you because it's one of those pictures. Um, this is a picture of an orphan, orphan children in Pakistan. It's a horrible picture. It's an older orphan hugging a younger orphan. What do you do with that? How do we respond to this? How are we supposed to respond to it? I don't know. I think there's some level of response. I don't want to become indifferent. I want to feel. I want to care. I want to look for opportunities. Maybe I can't minister to orphans in Pakistan, but maybe there are orphans here that God can lead me to. Next picture. Romans 12 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. God would never ask you to do something he's not willing to do himself. I think about the, the water that flows from the throne of God, and I think some of that water are, are tears. That's just my thought. I'm not saying they're tears of sadness. I, certainly the God who watches over the whole earth is seeing things right now that would make anyone cry. But also I think he's seeing things that bring tears of joy. I think, you know, there's joy in heaven when one person comes to Jesus. But I think th there's an emotional God sitting on a throne who cries, and he sent his son to weep. Second question, interactive, one more. Did you have a parent who was emotionally distant? Did you have a parent who was emotionally distant? Yes, both my parents were emotionally distant. Yes, my father was emotionally distant. Yes, my mother was emotionally distant. No, both my parents were emotionally in the game. What do you think? I could say both, but I'll, I'll, my mother was kind of, but I'll, I'll give her a pass on this one, and I'll say my father, because she was light years better than my dad. With the K girls and the Mercy girls I ministered to, it is now a complete horse race between mother wounds and father wounds. For the years ago, there would have been more father wounds than mother wounds. Right now, it's, it's a horse race. And here, um, it's significantly more fathers. But the majority of us had a parent who was emotionally disconnected. Two-thirds of us, right? So the point is, Sometimes the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and we have to be aware of that and, and allow God to touch our hearts. When I went to um, Amsterdam in 1983, uh, Billy Graham invited 5,000 evangelists from around the world uh, to go to a conference there he was holding. And um, there's four different places you could stay. One was like a nice hotel down to a hostel, and I, I went to the hostel. The hostel was in a red light district. And so I was in bunk beds with people from third world nations. 
And uh, walking to and from the conference center, we had to go through the red light district of Amsterdam. And it's notorious for hundreds and hundreds of prostitutes there. And we try and uh, not go down streets that would be um, potentially uh, overly sensual. Uh, but we would run into prostitutes. And in particular, there was one prostitute we spoke to outside the hostel. And we would try to talk to her for a while, minister to her, but she, um, you know, how, she's like, I got to keep you know, doing what I'm doing. And so we finally had to pay money to spend time with her. And he and I pooled our money and we spent 20 minutes or so, went to a room and sat down and talked with her. And um, within a few minutes though, you know, God gave us wisdom and brokenness from a boyfriend, rejection. She began to cry. And, and there was a tender moment there. Again, she sucked it up pretty quickly, but um, there was something there. But in that experience, we had to um, go out of our way to get involved in someone's life. Now, simultaneously, I am with these dozens of evangelists, and all of them gave me their cards. Every one of them wanted me to go to their nation. You know, and if I could print, if they still allowed us to print money, I could do that. But uh, I can't go to, I, I knew as I was getting, I had a stack of cards leaving, come to our nation. And I thought, I don't have the bandwidth for the prostitute emotionally. I don't have the bandwidth for these evangelists and the needs. And I still get Facebook. I have people regularly from around the world sharing about the wonderful thing they're doing in their ministry. And I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't even have time, candidly, to begin a conversation. Maybe it's wrong. I don't know. Maybe I could just stay up all night every night and just correspond with people around the world. The point is, the saturation of it uh, affects us. It affects me. Um, final verse, though, and I like. We're going to receive communion tonight. If someone coming to a keyboard here or a guitar, since he himself, Jesus, has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. But my concern tonight, in this age. I have a few convictions. I don't believe that it is either easy for us to process emotionally what is going on, and I don't think, like myself, that I am very successful doing it. And so I am concerned about me, and I want to invite you, perhaps you're concerned about you. You know, I talk about uh, even... Christmas, and let me say this, I'm not just concerned about the suffering emotions. I'm concerned about the joyous emotions. I'm talking, do I laugh enough? Do, do, do I rejoice enough? You know, uh, in my family, I would be probably, I would definitely be the most serious person there. H how do you straddle? You know, I look at what's going on. I feel a great sense of responsibility. But I don't want that to weigh me down where I'm not allowing the joy of the Lord to be my strength. Where, where I don't allow, I, I, and I'm doing relatively well with the pain and suffering and things, but looking around, in, in terms of my own, but looking around at the suffering on the planet, do I still have bandwidth? I want us to, we're going to pass the elements, and I want us just to hold the elements, and for us to ask the God of the universe, who gave his life for us, to give us whatever deposit of the emotion that is appropriate for each of us in our life, in our background. I think it's important, guys. I think we need to feel what God wants us to feel. And so if you have let Jesus Christ be the Lord of your life, then you can take these elements. We're going to uh, just pass the elements now. You can go ahead and pass them. And thank you so much. And, and then we're going to hold them and take them together. And so I'm just going to begin to pray up here, um, and then we'll take the elements in a second. So we'll pass them. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you wrote a script that did not spare you pain, did not spare you suffering. And, and so consequently, Lord, the suffering that you experienced that you learned obedience through. You said in your word that you learned obedience through the things that you suffered. And Lord, the suffering that we go through, Lord, is a refiner's fire. 
purifying our hearts and our motives, God. And Lord, I pray in this age, Lord, of overstimulation, Lord, where we are perhaps more and more insensitive with the deluge of experiences that we lose touch, God, with feeling what you feel, caring like you care. Lord, you saw the multitudes and you were moved, moved with compassion. Lord, I think about the the African-American community right now and how it convulses in brokenness. And, 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 and I, I do hear certain white voices speaking with a callousness. And even in the church, speaking with a just seeming like it's an overreaction, not empathizing, understanding the history, their journey, and the special, unique concern they have on so many different levels, Lord. And so uh, I'm not going to parse out every justice element, but Lord, I believe that a, a much greater level of empathy and care and concern should be on our hearts. When I look in the faces of, uh, of those who have suffered for whatever reason, be it physical pain for health issues or marital breakups or the loss of income or look in the face of homeless people, uh, those who are alcoholics or addicted to drugs or, or, or those, Lord, who are, have suffered injustice or their kids suffer injustice. I, but I look into a pained face. I want to care. I want to absorb. I don't want to try and minimize and mute what I'm hearing either to diminish my responsibility to respond in some way. I don't have to do it perfectly, but I have to do it. I have to show up emotionally. And, I, and I'm concerned, Lord. I am concerned in, in this age where, where I feel inundated, too much stimulus, and, and I feel like I'm shortchanging people I'm around. I'm not responding sufficiently, adequately. I ask your forgiveness for that, Lord. I know these are not heaven and hell issues, but they're hard issues, and they make me sad. I don't care what other people do. I don't care what other people think. I don't care if I'm the most emotional person in every room I ever walk in. I want to feel what you feel. I want to care like you care. Because in the end, I'm going to stand before you and nothing else matters. In revival, always, always, there is great emotion. The great challenge and moves of God throughout history and have been leaders trying to keep the emotion from getting out of control so that God can minister without people being distracted. In the revival I got saved in, there was lots, lots of emotion. People crying, crying out for God. I don't want to be part of a slick Christian church, Lord. I don't want to be part of a little group that everything is nice and tidy. I'm not interested in tidy Christianity, Lord. Blow it up, God. Blow up our hearts, God. Men and women who have children in ICU wards are not tidy. And their emotions aren't tidy. And when I come and visit them, they're not wanting me to be this staid, reserved person. And so, Lord, I, I pray, whatever it means for any of us, that our hearts would be tenderized. And so, as you have the bread in your hands, it represents the body and blood, the body of Jesus Christ that was broken shredded for us. Lord, this is a symbolic act, but I believe there's life as well. That's, there's an impartation that takes place. And so I pray you'd impart to us, Lord, that as we bear one another's burdens, we would so fulfill the law of Christ. Would you partake of the bread, remembering the body of Jesus that was broken for you,
I think, you know, at this Christmas time, I think of the Christmas carol and the various renditions of it. Charles Dickens was a Christian. And I remember one particular version, Alistair Sim, 1953, after coming to his senses, he showed up at his nephew's party and he looked in their eyes and he said, would you forgive a pig-headed old fool for having no eyes to see and no ears to hear all these years. God, I don't want to be a pig-headed old fool, Lord. I want my eyes to see and my ears to hear and my heart to feel. So Lord, as you said your life was in your blood and you shed your blood, you poured your blood out for us. And I believe, Lord, you, you felt not just the physical pain, but the emotional pain. Some doctors believe that you died of a broken heart, that your heart exploded in some way. Your heart was broken. So, Lord, break our hearts in an appropriate way, Lord, for what breaks your heart. Would you partake of the cup remembering the blood of Jesus? If you can lift your hand, if you want just God to impart his heart to you, Lord, we lift our hearts, we lift our hands to you, God. I think now of the, the black men who are lifting their hands around the country, thousands saying, and women, don't shoot, don't shoot. I think of the pain that's there, the convoluted emotions. It's a sign of surrender, Lord. We want to surrender our hearts to you, God. We thank you that you took the bullet for us, God. You suffered pain for us, Lord. Expand our hearts, God. Expand our hearts, God. You have showed us, O oh man, what is good and what you require of us, that we should do justice, do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with you, God. I pray for a church that has broken, tender hearts, God, that we'd be poured out, God. Even as a woman wept over your feet, Lord, and wept over, washed your feet with her tears and then dried it with her hair, God. You didn't say, stop being so emotional. You embraced it, God. I pray for a move of your spirit across this region during worship, during services, in our homes, driving down the road, wherever we are. I pray for a genuine emotion from the heart of God to fill our hearts, Lord. I don't want to be a stoic. I don't want to be some kind of a stiff religious figure. I want to be a humble man of God. I pray for us to be humble men and women of God, Lord. Our, our, our mission on this earth is to advance the kingdom of God Advance the kingdom of God by representing Jesus well. We want to represent you well. And we want to make disciples who represent you well. And that includes emotion, Lord. I pray that would happen. Bless your people tonight, Lord. This is like a pre-Christmas message, Lord. Let our hearts be tender. As we come... In Christmas with loved ones, Lord. I, I remember numerous Christmas times when there was no one saved there at Susie's house. No one was saved yet. I didn't like the language. I didn't like the jokes. I didn't like the stories. I didn't like, I didn't like. But we loved them. We loved, we listened, we participated, we waited. And one by one, Lord, you picked them off and you rescued their lives. Give us patience, patience, Lord, for relatives during this season, Lord, who are uh, hard to handle, Lord. Let us love them, pray for them, forgive them. And Lord, use us again uh, to be your, your life on this earth, Lord. I bless your people now in Jesus' name. Amen.